and one emotional podcast, Conversations for Inspiration on the Go. We offer on the go inspiration because our whole heart is set on beauty and our best bets are set on art. Hi, Samisha. How are you? Welcome to One Emotional Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here. And thank you so much, Marion, for hosting me and inviting me. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone uh, from India. And it's nice to meet you. Mm, yes, it's wonderful to have you here, Samisha. So, Samisha, she's a creative meditation expert, a yoga therapist, a holistic well-being practitioner. She's a founder of Adardawani. She's best described as pure joy in motion. And I love this because literally she embodies the pure joy in motion. So Misha is a groundbreaking leader in the field of personal development, health and well-being and conscious dance. Through her fluid style of facilitation, Sumisha has helped thousands of people worldwide become more embodied, healthy, joyful and full of life. Bringing ancient to mainstream, She holds a non-judgmental creative space for the human mind to come in a state of flow and rediscover their original expressions. So Sumisha, how did this interest in you know, personal development and in the arts originate? How, what's your story? So my story is a culmination of what is uh, my life's destiny. So I, have, I was not Uh, prepared for this. I'm a cl- I've been a classical dancer and a singer and have uh, done my education in uh, classical arts to be very, very specific. My mother is an artist. She runs a gurukul back in my city, in my town in India. So from the age of five, I have learned uh, music, dance, painting as a part of my growing up, apart from my studies. I was gearing up to become a theater artist and a dancer. And in the do somewhere in here, I was thinking I would become. Uh, so I joined uh, the Indian Army for six years. I'm, I'm a military veteran. Wow. So I can shoot to kill. kill. I can uh, drive a tank. I have wonderful, uh, very, very wonderful experiences from the Indian military services. And I left, uh, I took a voluntary retirement from the army to pursue my classical dancing and all my creative signature styles, I thought so. Uh, I had a small injury in my back, which uh, really toppled my entire effort to leave army and to practice back my feminine energy, embodiment of dance and, you know, theater and arts and everything. And I would just kind of, you know, It was just like crashed out because I had a small injury during the training and it just like extrapolated and I had a back pain so severe that uh, my doctor said like you cannot dance for a year at least you know find a solution to this. You can for now just stop dancing. And in that entire journey to cut a stop wrong story short, I had to find an answer. I found Iyengar Yoga. I recovered my back. Then I did an art-based therapy course because I had fallen in love with the healing aspect of dancing by now because I was not able to dance uh, uh, professionally. But then, yeah, it taught me how to express myself because till the time I was a dancer, I think uh, we are so much involved in the technique and the performance. So dance to express, not to impress was not there. And so this entire journey culminated. I was already a trainer in the army. So when I stepped out, I was utilizing all these tools. And I worked in the prison of Michael and Arthur Roche with the female inmates and the male inmates. And I saw the transformations happening. And I kept on finding answers. I had to find answers. Uh, and I kept on searching this. And that's how I become or I'm becoming what I am, and it's still a process. Wow, it's beautiful. And I imagine the kind of like cultural clash between an artist inside the army. 
Tell us about that experience because, you know, being an artist is more being in touch with, you know, our feminine side and kind of like, you know, emotional expression connected with, with beauty. And sometimes in the army, maybe you are told to cut off maybe those kind of emotions, right? Tell us about how was the beginning of the army in your experience? So let's see, uh, in India or all over the world, I think, Marion, the first thing what women do is that they compete with men. Mm -hmm. And I did so. I did so in my young days. A uh, few things were very girly for me. A few things were very, very, you know, under the radar for me as a woman of India. And uh, joining army was uh, about, you know, gaining, uh, gaining something which was way beyond us. Because it's a very tight selection, no? It's a very tight selection. So yeah, army was very different. But then there also, I fought to to dance, and I continued, though it was not appreciated very widely. Because I somehow think that people think dance is not intellectual, mm. and for me as a classical dancer from India, I think it it is the first. It is one of the most super complicated things if I have ever learned in my life. More than English, more than the army, more than anything I do in my life. I think dance is very difficult. People just underestimate it because you don't dance. Or art, for that matter, is not taken seriously. And that was the case in the uh, in the army also. But uh, I managed. And yes, I had uh, I had to like you know fight back to you know embody my feminine energy but these are two simplified versions isn't it like feminine and masculine resides between both of us within us yes. so yeah in a very very conservative format yes i had to embody my feminine energy in its full beauty once i came out of the army so yeah it, it was a radical uh, experience of my life mm -hmm. it is till date it till date it has its uh, effect And I am what I am because of those six years, it just changed my perspective about life. Of course, you get so much knowledge, right? From being in the army. And I just want to pinpoint what you, what you mentioned. I think all of human beings, we have feminine energies and we have masculine energies, right? And there's specific times in our lives where we need to be in touch with either our feminine or our masculine side. It's not kind of like linear. It's not constant. It's not like if you're born with some masculine energies and it continues steady that way for the rest of your life. It's like, it's like if we ask to embody and we, and if we ask these energies to be more uh, prominent in our lives. So for example, I don't know, in my 20s, I connected a lot with my masculine energy, right? A lot about sports, about, you know, action and adventure and like extreme sports. And I connected a lot with the masculine energy of business, no? kind of like this competitive side and this kind of like do it all, no rest. Come on, yeah, you know, let's, let's grow faster and let's, you know, have more clients and all of that. And then I became a mother and it like boom, completely came into this feminine side of, you know, nurturing. I was taking care of, you know, changing competition to more of a cooperative model, right? To be more in tune with my emotions, to be, you know, kind of like a caretaker. And it was like boom, completely the opposite no and now you know my kids are three three and a half and one year and a half so wow uh, yeah so after one year and a half kind of like i'm starting to navigate and to um, kind of like bring you know that balance again instead of like being fully on my feminine side i'm starting to let in more of my masculine energy because my kids are growing So I think it's kind of like in specific times in our lives, we need to tune in with our feminine, our, our masculine energy. And have you ever had, um, when you were doing a feminine activity that you had to embody from a masculine perspective? For example, have you ever danced from a masculine perspective? So... <laughs> For me, uh, masculine and feminine, like when we are utterly soft, when we do something really soft, like we term it as feminine. But then as I've grown and I've studied feminine and masculine energy as, say, uh, chemical formulas or as very empirical uh, 
terms, I sincerely believe like uh, any movement, what I'm doing, even if I'm doing a feminine movement, it requires my logical, my masculine energy to stay, to get stabilized. And in India specifically, what I have seen, whenever we dance, like if we dance like a Lord Shiva's dance, you know, like when we're dancing something, it is both masculine and feminine energy and they have to be balanced in order to express those energies. Like express that power. So it's not a very unilateral thinking like, okay, this is this, this is that. Mm-hmm. It's both masculine and feminine taken together. And uh, I had this thing of like, I never had this distinction. I'm very adaptable. So while like six years in the army, I was performing for, with my mom. My mom has a true pain. Mm-hmm. So she chose to be a folk singer and a folk researcher. Mm-hmm. So she wears multiple hats. She's uh, a retired principal, a national body folk singer. She's a poetess. She sings guzzles. She writes really well. So she's multifaceted. So I used to wear a wig. I used to have like short crop hair and I used to wear a wig to dance it out. Mm. So I have no distinction that I'm, you know, adapting into being a dancer, then in the army. So everything was like always like this. I was signaled out. Oh, you don't look like an army officer. Oh, you don't look as if you're in the army when I was in the dancer's dress. Mm-hmm. So my journey is a little different. And yes, uh, we dance as dancers. There's so many dances which are from a very masculine perspective. Even like when I do a sensual dancing, mm. like coming from an Indian perspective, it is at times a very, very masculine perspective. You know, when you put in that like see when you are very decisive when you are very logical when you are very like you know like there so you have to be there to take a stance Mm. you just can't so I really uh, the foundation of Indian classical wisdom of dance is the integration of masculine and feminine energy Mm. it is not one side and one side there are embodiment but then generally it is so mixed and match for me like it is very very fluid for me Mm. We tend to box it out, but then, yes, is this sacred feminine through which we go on to reach to our sacred masculine? Because feminine is creativity, feminine energy, the Shakti is that energy through which a lifeless, uh, like a lifeless, like say, the Purusha and the Prakriti, the, the consciousness awakens, like the universe. Like, there is a very academic study on it, you know. Mm-hmm. So for me, I, I'm a, I'm literally very a cat because mm-hmm. I had to study and interconnect because we use a lot of words which goes from this to that. Yes. So I had to figure out. So that mm-hmm. is my story. I love it. I love it. And with all of your experience, you know, being a dancer, being to the personal development, um, helping many people, you've curated retreats. You've also, you know, performed within the classical arts and you have, you know, this kind of like enriching creational background. What is it? What, what have you learned from all the work that you've done that human beings are craving for? I think. We are craving for, or ultimately we don't understand it, but then we are craving for simple childlike innocence. Mm-hmm. We are craving for that. Because the moment we come to that childlike innocence, we simply become simple. Mm-hmm. Our ego also takes a rest, does not go away. It just becomes simple. Like, you know, it also, like if the ego is looking outwards, it starts looking towards the soul. So it it becomes a little more supple and subtle and then only you can appreciate the world or beauty of life. Otherwise, it is, I think it's just, otherwise it's just an intellectual process to uh, imbibe something and relish, to relish, you need to pause, you need to slow down, you need to be simple, you need to be kind enough and Yes, uh, for me, I think uh, humans, this is what they should be looking for. And meaningful connections. I think there has been too much, too much of focus on passion. You know, pursuing your passion, pursuing your passion. I do not come from that school. I have burnt my fingers pursuing my passion. And I sincerely believe there is one more philosophy of life that with compassion, you should take care of your passion of your life. But then the main aim is to have a fulfilled life. 
mm-hmm. you don't have to necessarily keep going after it you know like you know like generally it's thinking that like for example i'm doing a job and if i'm a photographer so you don't necessarily have to leave a job to become that photographer photographer you know yes like you know what i'm trying to say like i can remain in the army and still become still be a creative dancer still become a creative soul that also is an option for a fulfilled life to keep on you know pursuing my slow life mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. so there there is a whole lot of focus on we need to have a slow life totally and i think if we if we observe kids we understand and we learn a lot from them right first of all yes. kids, how we all learned walking is by falling down and we fell many 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 times before we started walking right and nowadays if we start a business and we fail then kind of like we get kind of like with an identity of failure right it's not like if we fail and get up as easy as we were kids and i agree with you that also needs to change in becoming more simple another example for example is the joy and the presence that kids have kids don't know the difference between you know like one day is going to be over it's kind of like one day it's one day it's long it's a lot of hours it's a lot of minutes they're living it you know in the present moment they're not thinking about other things and for us as humans it's kind of like we've learned and we've um glorified being busy and being with no time because we're chasing i don't know what what kind of fulfillment we think that is going to arrive by being incredibly busy maybe it's you know full of achievements however we define those achievements or however we define that success but for example for kids they're not achieving anything if they start taking a class i don't know any t- t- type of class it could be soccer it could be tennis it could be whatever they are enjoying the moment they don't care if eventually there's you know one success or anything it's just they are in flow and i think you know becoming adults we sometimes forget about that essence that still lives inside of us because we are still children and we still have that essence of our souls we developed obviously different capabilities right cognitive capabilities physical capabilities you know maturity capabilities many of them but maybe we can use these capabilities to approach life in a more simple in a more slower or present you know kind of life because eventually the only way out outside of this planet outside of, of this world is death So what we make between birth and death is what actually is going to fulfill us right 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 like meaningful connections you know because that is what i generally miss when i stepped out of the army it has been so many years but in the kind of bonding what i used to share with my peer with my batch it's still on and i do not feel that deep connectivity in an urban space specifically i stay in mumbai where everything is very class oriented everything is very cliche click circle oriented you have to be a particularly at a, you have to look cool you have to sound cool like you know there are many parameters on which the urban community uh, is built and there is no sense of community but i have seen i have worked on the ground i really miss that relationship with my soldiers mm-hmm. like the kind of innocence like i was their leader i was their officer but then there was a certain kind of bond what we used to share and that it was so fulfilling that you never felt alone in the army you never felt isolated in the army never had those like for me like in my and i i as an officer used to have a lot of appreciation for my men so as slowly i began to learn how to be more humble mm-hmm. yet very very commanding and yet looking after them mm. but that humbleness for me it doesn't work in the civil street mm-hmm. but i fight for my uh, humbleness i fight for my kindness to stay put into my category into my heart because otherwise it, the world the way it is it makes it can make me go very cynical so so i choose not to kind of you know, talk about many many issues i choose beauty 
Mm-hmm. And I understand everything is, for me, it is not easy, you know, like I'm very, very nature oriented, very kindness oriented, very ethical. But I then I have chosen beauty, like whatever beauty remains, let's grow that. Let's contribute one tree at a time. Let's contribute one smile at a time, one person at a time. So I, yes, I, I follow it in my daily life and this is how I am and I've chosen to be. So yes, we need, uh, and as you I think once we are connected, uh, once we have celebrations, once we have trust, I don't think most of the mental health issues, what we are actually undergoing will vanish mm-hmm. or it does vanish, you know? Totally. Like, There's this famous study made with uh, lab rats that um, they isolated a rat and they gave this rat um, water with heroin. And as you know, heroin is one of the most addictive drugs. And so Mm -hmm. the rat consumed it, right? And couldn't stop, no? And every time they brought the water with the heroin, the rat would would consume it until eventually the rat was completely addicted and, you know, was about to to die. They grabbed Mm -hmm. this rat and moved her into this kind of like rat park where um, it had friends and it had, you know, the playground and things that went up and down and the spin wheel and all of these things, no? So eventually the rat re- rehabilitated and um, and they gave, you know, water, normal water and food and the water with heroin. And the rat smelled the water with heroin and smelled the normal water and selected the normal water. So it gave a lot of information to scientists who are studying addictions that sometimes addictions have to do with a lack of connection. And if we actually address a problem that, you know, we're kind of like we're human beings, we're social beings, and now they were living in this um, single unit family sections, right? Instead of living in a community where we kind of like have lost, you know, this sense of living in a tribe or in a community or, you know, we're isolated, we're connected with our cell phones, of course, but we're more alone than ever before, right? And um, and we're seeing this rise of anxiety and depression. And I think it's really important to start talking about connection and not only connection to other people, but also connection to ourselves. Because at the end, pursuing that connection, pursuing that intimacy, pursuing that vulnerability and talking about it is going to make us human beings understand the thread that connects us all and is going to open that creativity between us. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's very true that because uh, I also believe that after studying so much, after like you don't realize it very soon when you are growing up, mm-hmm. but then after, of all the processes I have seen that I can dance alone, I can do my art alone, but then when I do it with people, the kind of energy which rises, I can never do it. So I don't understand that like there are many, many workshops where I've attended where people have not bothered to switch on their cameras. Like if I do not, if I don't see you, how do I, how do I communicate to you? So for me, expression is very important because the kind of person person I am and I'm very sensitive like Mm -hmm. towards connecting and once we've connected that I think uh, all of our problems are just kind of you know solved you're you're in total present you know like this is what I have seen that's why I love collaborations I love to Mm co-create because you know what like what I have realized people say you have to do this this and this like as a as a healer, as a researcher, I'm already doing donning three caps. Healing is very time consuming and energy consuming. Therapy again is very time consuming and energy consuming. And C I research. Mm-hmm. So three things gone. And the fourth thing I have to, you know, do take up my workshops and you know, connect mm-hmm. with people. So just wondering why why do we do everything all alone? Why can't we connect together? And then co-create and collaborate because that means you're burning less as a as a person who is into wellness yourself. So most of the time, the way it is in the way it is everywhere, we tend to preach more than that we're eating by example. It's very difficult to be today in this world 
to be uh, connected with yourself and uh, with the community and with the universe. Practically, theoretically, everything is easy. So yeah, that's a quite a quite a task for me as well. But then yeah, I really would appreciate more connections happening on ground, physically, because the energy exchange makes us human. It makes us normal. Like, you know, sitting all the day in the in the AC room, on our TVs, now with the advent of mega verse, you know, things will just become more and more into the screen time. I don't think so. We really require that anymore. We really need to have a balanced screen time, technology, but then yes, balance it out. We have to balance, otherwise it's a too much of, too much of, you know, it's too much of crisis we have we will be facing and we are facing as a as a collective of course yes it's constantly more uh tilted into you know like spending a lot of hours in the office sitting down you know working in the computer eventually we're not going to connect there we're not going to connect with our laptops <laughs> right we're going to to crave for that human essence for that human connection and um one of the things that i find fascinating that i've seen kind of like um a rise again in these new generations it's about the this need for um creativity and beauty and with all your background as an artist tell us how do you connect with beauty how is your experience with the aesthetic emotions and what they evoke in you I lost you. Sorry, I think you're in mute. Yes, sorry. For me, beauty is resilience. Like the beauty of life is what inspires me to get back on my feet and start doing what I'm doing. Like beauty is that eternal sunshine, which is the abode of our soul. And Sondare is called in Hindi. Sondare has so many aspects and specifically coming from the Indian aesthetic wisdom, uh, beauty is the ultimate, like beauty is that mystical consciousness which actually, you know, showers us with the, uh, with the love we crave for mm -hmm. or the grace we are craving for. With beauty comes gratitude and with gratitude comes grace. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I love Without it. beauty, we cannot command the grace also because only when we look at the beauty of life, then we start appreciating those small little things. And then that gratitude comes in. Or is like it, this please, feeling you know, which comes that. from inside now. Please, please repeat that because I think it's so important that it deserves people to listen to it for a second time. It's so important. Yeah, like so, so with beauty comes the feeling of gratitude from inside you feel teary eyed you feel ecstatic you feel uh, you feel also with that beauty of a relationship which you had just kind of you know left for some reason you know if it was your fault you understand the beauty of that relationship it, it was intangible and that is how you learn mm -hmm. and i think human emotions if they are veered towards beauty then i me and marion shine together Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's very how if you do not appreciate beauty, then you will be possessive, you will be jealous, you will always be angry. Beauty gives gratitude, and from gratitude comes grace. Mm -hmm. And you, in any culture in the world, grace cannot be commanded, it is showered or it is blessed. It's a blessing, we cannot command it. Yes. Uh, neither while we, oh, I, th that is practically I have seen, you know, right? That grace is inside out or something just happens and then it comes to you. So, yes. It's kind of like this connection with our higher essence, right? When we, when we are immersed in an experience of beauty, when we are watching a um, musical performance, an artistic performance, when we're watching a beautiful person as well, when we're watching nature. It's kind of like these moments that take our breath away and these moments that kind of like helps us, you know, kind of like dig them deeper and, and really appreciate what life is and obviously feel gratitude for what it is. 
But I think beauty has differentiated, you know, humans with other mammals because we have the ability to create beauty, to appreciate beauty, to observe beauty, to connect with beauty. And it's kind of like this invisible thread in a sense that's all around us that, you know, is there, you know, waiting to be connected. And sometimes, you know, we have different priorities or different values in our everyday life and we forget to connect with beauty. But there's, you know, beauty in in just watching a flower. There's beauty in, you know, watching a cub. There's beauty in just staring up in the sky or just, you know, staring at the top of the, of the tree. And there's beauty. We have the ability to create beauty with our arts and crafts. So we are artistic beings from our essence. We are born as artists. And many people here in Luan, they tell us, you know, like, for example, from all the, the Luan live sessions, from the uh, podcast sessions, from the Show Your Fire um, art gallery exhibition that we did, a lot of people have kind of like this um, sense that they are not artists, that because they do not see their draw well or sing well or dance well, then eventually they are not artists. And being an artist is about focusing on the creative process, on the artistic process, but not in the end result. There could be many museums around the world and many art crews around the world that focus on the end result. What is the masterpiece that you've created? But in Luan, we are really focused on the process that made you create whatever you want to create. And especially the emotions inside that process that are going to get you there. And we know that the creative process is not easy. Sometimes we have the deliciousness, the blissfulness that a moment of inspiration can bring when you've created an amazing paragraph for your book, when you've created the best lyrics for your song, when you've created the best movements for your dance. We've all felt the deliciousness of being completely immersed and connected with inspiration and beauty. And also we have the duality of that. When we have the paralysis analysis, when we feel a blank page, when we know where to start, when we're frustrated, when we want to kill everything and just you know throw it out of the window. And those parts are also an essential step for the creative process, for being an artist. What have you done in those experiences when you felt that you were stuck, that you were frustrated in the art that you were creating? Uh -huh, so I think like for me right now, the challenge is to, because I have, uh, I have my, my entire instructions are naturally very artistic. My sessions are also very layered. Mm. Uh, like it is automatic because I have learned so many modules that I feel like if uh, Marion is moving in the process, she comes to a state of flow. So she might as well write a poem for herself. So if dance movement session, Mm -hmm. I am doing like painting and flowing and like, it, I do not stop there. Mm -hmm. I just do not stop there. So for me, that artistic process of my own, my own instructions, my, the way I teach, the way I look into my patients or to my students, I feel, I, I feel I want to get more inspired as to tell, as to like, I'm, I'm still figuring out as to tell how to tell the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I go out, I leave it, and then I seek divine help. Mm -hmm. And if I then if I don't understand anything, then I come back to my very basic fact that I have discovered this. Mm -hmm. And yes, there cannot be many takers. Uh, but let's go on to do that. You know? mm -hmm. It's it's the ultimately come back to that question. You know, even if you're stuck with something, mm -hmm. and if, when you're stuck with something, I think. Uh, I think going back to nature is uh, and doing nothing for a while, uh, just taking, trying to take your, uh, you know, mind off it. Like something gets inspired and something just comes into that, you know, heart and of course, it's, it's always. I think it, it's with everyone, you know, like uh, the, the the flow comes and I have to sit, mm -hmm. and at the end the flow is not there no matter how much you sit. So this cues I have been diligently taking. Mm -hmm. which is not so business-like. Yes. So you have to stop everything else if that day you are you are flowing. So yes, I'm managing to, you know, manage mm -hmm. my masculine and feminine in this thing when you are inspired, not inspired. 
So not to berate yourself, not, not to be harsh on myself. Yes. Because I think as, uh, that is one thing which I'm still learning. Of course, such an important topic. How do we treat ourselves with more self-compassion? It's quite difficult because we sometimes tend to be more compassionate with other people and we tend to be way tougher with ourselves. Right. Maybe we kind of like dismiss or forget, you know, um, I don't know, somebody else's action and something that we did were there kind of like, you know, all the time, you know, being matters are ourselves because we did X, Y, and Z. And we forget that also we are human beings and we deserve a gentle touch with our own selves. Right. It's quite yeah. easy to yes. be tough on us. Yes, yes. That is why I think uh, when I, my mind is unable, as as a practitioner myself, I think I really get into softness and suppleness. I do soft activities. I do autistic activities. I do like I I learn. I'm learning ukulele, so I just start ripping it out, or I just take a paint and I start doing it. So it brings softness to my entire uh, entire harsh mentality because I've grown up in a classical background so my mother is has been so strict mm -hmm. that like my parameter of my own self-criticism would be naturally this high yeah. so you it's not easy to know when you're being a procrastinator when you're and 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 for art you have to be a little disciplined uh to bring about something which are which is aesthetically sound you just cannot you know learn dance for two days and the third day you become a master I do not come from that school. So yeah, being when you're being harsh and then you have to become like that, you know, self-praising uh, human, I still, I think, uh, five, five more years to go in that. But yeah, I'm, I'm learning to kind of, you know, uh, I've also learned to kind of you know, appreciate my own beauty inside out mm -hmm. to what I have been endowed with. And I think that that's what the first thing I see in other people also, because they come out as blame factors. Yes. I call them the blame factors. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, at times I also think somebody should get a bit of talk, talk to me out, you know? Yeah. Like when somebody really appreciates you, it really means a lot, you know? Mm. And then you also are, when you do something through wire art or through something that small little thing, like the way when I cook with full dedication, Mm -hmm. and you know slowness the food comes out in a very very it just surprises me also so I feel very you know kind and happy and you know about myself so yeah being harsh and that balance is is quite an evolution for everybody I think so as an, an artist it's quite a challenge of course and we're reaching this point where eventually there's more information there's more studies about you know self compassion about being harsh with ourselves and i find it interesting that i want to ask you sumisha mm -hmm. is there any one near you or it was maybe yourself the person that guided you through this kind of like self compassionate journey mm -hmm. Or was it your mom or was it any other family figure that helped you reach into that self-compassion for yourself? Uh, the story of my life is that I always looked for mentors. I didn't get any. Mm -hmm. uh, but life became the biggest mentor for me. The first idea of self-compassion came to me when I pushed my body to run five kilometers I stepped out of the army in spite of my injured back. I, I danced for four hours, danced for my, uh, like practice my theater for four hours. So eight hours you're standing. Mm -hmm. So pushing my body is one thing which I don't do anymore. Mm -hmm. I become very compassionate. Like few of the complex asanas, I still cannot perform. But then I see my body growing every day. And I have really cultivated that practice through looking at my body, oh, my left uh, uh, quadriceps are opening up. No, I'm healing. My back is getting, you know, stronger day by day. It has been nine years, but then believe me, healing is such a slow process. Mm -hmm. That when, So that is how that self-compassion came. And my partner, my, my husband, he is like, why are you so harsh on yourself? You know, like he started talking to me that you're very harsh on yourself. You don't have to be. Because, you know, you are coming from a classical background where you're dancing for 30 years, the same damn thing. 
Mm-hmm. And still you're not ready to go out and conquer the world. Mm-hmm. Just imagine that is the mindset we have been drilled and we have grown up with. Yeah. So yeah, my I think uh, my life and my partner. I think I'm very very happy mm-hmm. to. He's he's the he actually brought this thing into my into my like work in front of my eyes. You know that you can be uh, if you tune it right, it will become a weapon for you. Yes. So yes. That's exactly. beautiful. The type of, you know, teachers and masters that come into our lives to teach us something really important that helps us, you know, see the mirrors of how we are treating ourselves and who we are. So chapeau for your, for your husband, helping you to see that, to see that treatment that you're doing to yourself. And I completely connect with you in a sense that, um, in my personal experience, it happens exactly the same way. Like I'm harsh on myself and I have uh, a mentor called Susanna and my husband, Alex, both of them are constantly telling me like, Oh my God, you're so hard on yourself. You know, please be more tender on yourself. Please be more compassionate on yourself. Like, no, but, and I, I, I believe that some, well, many times in my life, I kind of like confused being, a heart on myself, I confuse it with uh, achieving things. And I thought that if I treated myself more harshly, eventually I was going to achieve more. I was going to address more, have more, conquer more. And sometimes it doesn't happen that way because sometimes we're driven by fear, no? which is kind of like in my yeah. first experience. And sometimes then we eventually change to be driven by love and driven by the heart. And when we change to being driven by love, everything is more tender. Everything is more soft, but fierce at the same time. So, well, yes, I, I love this, you know, soft, but fierce. Yeah, that's my, that's my thought process also, you know, because, um, uh, because, see, I'm a high, it's just my life, like I've just been getting trained all my life. So like yoga, army, drill, firing, dance, singing, theater, music, you name it. And I've been trained in it, like in a specific, in what to do. Mm-hmm. So my world revolves around it. So, but uh, when I was a dancer, everyone expected me to perform really beautifully. But now I ask people to feel it beautifully. And then understand the techniques, then understand the skill sets. So with love, when we start doing it, we really achieve the end result to begin with. It gets imbibed in ourselves. You know, for example, if I have to become really soft as a, as a, as a Nike, as a heroine, well, I want you to feel soft uh, as a dancer. But uh, if I'm not talking from a love perspective, like the inside love of that, softness to crack this it becomes a performance pressure mm-hmm. you don't know as a child you don't know as a teenager how to you know show the various kinds of love mm-hmm. but this is very very applicable for me in all my processes even in my prison if, if you take me to the saddest of the setting i will talk about love and beauty i'll start from there and it really helps for people to connect to themselves See, if we do not know something, you have to be very slow and loving to the other person for them to imbibe that, mm-hmm. whether it's culture or a skill set or a habit to go. Or if, you, if you're feeling depressed, if you're feeling anxious, if you're fighting back to you know heal your heartbreak, it's, it's love which counts. Mm-hmm. Everybody needs love, you know, and love is that portion which inspires us to, you know, work every day on our negative habits or something which is you know, drowning us. We understand that. So mm-hmm. it has been vastly underestimated. Mm-hmm. It has been so much underestimated that only when you love your body, only when you love your emotions, you can fulfill them and then you can leave them. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, that detachment, what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. That detachment can only come when you have done a certain process. It's not so easy the way it's like step number one, two, three. Emotions makes us human. Mm-hmm. To shut down emotions means you are going to have PTSD. To shut down emotions, you're going to have addictions. 
We shut down emotions, you're going to get addicted to so many things. To shut down your emotions means and uh, being violent at times when you're not supposed to be violent. Mm-hmm. So, so that love also replaces shame. And in my entire entire life, whatever I've seen, most of the problems what we face is due to shame. Mm-hmm. And only love can replace shame. I don't think so. Anything else can, body love can replace the body shame we have. And that shame is replaced. Replaced, we go on to have like a lovely self-esteem. Then we say no to domestic violence. Mm-hmm. We say to no to any kind of violence. Either we are perpetrated, we are kind of, you know, doing it for on someone else or someone is doing it on us. Emotional, physical, mental. I think love gives us the spectrum to understand the perspective of it. It's like a filter. Mm-hmm. You have the filter, it, everything starts looking in a different direction. You don't have that filter. Mm-hmm. Nothing makes sense. So yes, I think we need to have a comeback of love. Of course. In this, in this seven, seven colors, of not course. in just one. Love and beauty are the way. Right. And yes, sometimes yes. we're craving other things that we think are going to bring us love and beauty when eventually love and beauty are there, ready to be accessed, ready to be felt. And sometimes, you know, when you were talking about, you know, emotions, we sometimes tend to um, avoid emotions because sometimes it's easier in the, in the short term not to feel them. Right. Because You know, we have, I'm not going to name them good or bad because they're not good or bad, but maybe, you know, they're yes. comfortable or uncomfortable emotions. And if we get better at feeling, feeling shame at its core, feeling vulnerability at its core, feeling anger at its core, then we will also open that space for feeling love at its core and feeling joy at its core. And it's actually, you know, to being able to integrate these emotions, to feeling them at their maximum capacity. <laughs> Because when we tune in and connect with love, then kind of like we have all the potentiality in our hands of what we want to create and the life that we are actually living. So I think it's such an important topic. So Misha, thank you so much for bringing it, you know, and pinpointing it in the correct way as, as you just mentioned it. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. So before we close, Misha, I want to ask you a few questions. The idea is for you to answer them in one or a few words. And um, the first answer that comes to mind, that's the best one. Okay. So what is art for you? Art for me mm-hmm. is being human. Mm. That's beautiful. Who's your favorite author? My favorite author is currently, or for the past seven years, has been BKS Ayangar. I've stopped studying every other things. Mm-hmm. So my favorite author is BKS Ayangar. I love it. Okay. And advice that changed your life. There are many advices which has come to me. One thing which changed my life was like courage is grace under pressure. And it was given to me by my ex-boss in the army. And he said like, if you can smile under any circumstances, you're a very good officer. And courage is grace under pressure. So when I'm under pressure and start being so stressed out, I remember that line and again, Mm-hmm. get back to being graceful graceful right? you know like you cannot fight pettiness with pettiness mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yes really... courage is grace and pressure i really like it mm-hmm. i i love that um the best quality in humans they're wonderful <laughs> like they have such amazing the best they, they have limitless potential i still wonder at humans and like how much they can do like by these two hands you know like the mentalist the cyclist I, I'm still amazed at through what all humans do in their lives you know? like in different parts of the world the seven billion all of us mm-hmm. like they're amazing that 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 side of human intelligence is simply outstanding mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I agree with you 
a book that you recommend? Uh, I would recommend uh, The Art and Science of Forest Reading by Dr. King Lee. Mm. Like mm. It, it's such a simple read and uh, connecting with Mother Nature is so important. But uh, to read it in a simple terms, I think it's it's amazing. I've given it to a lot of my friends and I have you know, like they do not understand what I say. I said, okay, fine. Don't understand this. Someone else who's talking about it. Let's read. So yeah, Dr. King Lee is the science of, uh, you know, the, the art and science of false reading. Pretty cool book. Mm, amazing. Very cool. What feeds your soul? Kindness. Mm. The most pressing issue for humanity or one of the most pressing issues for humanity? Isolation and loneliness. If humans can agree on this, you will be very happy. What would that be? Being sustainable. Mm. Like together at one go that like if you build one building, let's plant 100 trees around it. It should be a part of the system to, to have the technology and the nature going together. I think I would be really happy because I love the technological advances. But then it's, if it was not extreme, it was in sync with the beauty of Mother Nature. I don't think so. There was any harm in being like high rising, high rises with like, you know, terrace gardens and like vertical gardens. And you sustain it like by being creative, like, you know, by getting our own ideas, which is, which are, which are fabulous, which gives you money. And it is not like this mad rush right now of being cannabis. You know, two extreme sides, you know. Mm -hmm. I still don't understand it. I, I have grown up so much, but then I still don't understand it. Like, okay, I am not able to pay because I don't have that headspace for billion dollar or money and all. But then I sincerely feel like, you know, like with money and power, why can't we just match, marry the two sides together? Like, you know, it's just enough to, you know, yes. uh, make underground tunnels and go to the space. And we just, uh, just stop this environmental disaster, what we are doing. With. And it is, it is a disaster because we can see it and for future gen generations, it is not good. For us, it's not good. As a collective, it is not good. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why we are making our lives difficult. You know what? We are the only species who knows that we are going to die. Rest of they don't know. Like they have a feeling, but then they do not count their numbers. Then, oh, now I'm 60, I'm 70. <laughs> oh, I've grown old. And like, oh, when I, like, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have made, as a collective, we have made our life harder. Mm, totally. totally. When it could be easier, no? Um, what would you like to scream to the whole world? Let's dance. Mm. <laughs> it would be amazing for the whole world to be dancing. <laughs> yeah, once we dance, you know, like together, we, we, we come together. You know, that's the power of it. You know? Like and dance like this just biorhythmic, like just, just just simple dancing, not much of like fancy steps and all just synchronized, you know, like coming together. Kind of improvised, kind of like flowy dance, no? But everyone yeah, Flo is so synchronized. most connected with. Amazing. And the last question. What is it that you have lived and that no one could miss experiencing? Army life. I'm sorry? I think army life and dancing army. with strangers. <laughs> army life and dancing with strangers. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I, I have started dance parties like whenever I start I dance on the beach, everyone joins in and I've seen that like just people come and join, 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 and it becomes a big, big circle. So yes, for me, I would be a little different because I just dance out of nowhere. So I don't know. I just accepted myself like that. Yes. I love it. I love it. Chapeau to this acceptance of you in your most uh pure essence and authentic essence. <laughs> <laughs> yes like the way people sing and people sing with them the way people play percussion or like I for me movement and expressions are a tune mm -hmm. it just feels so beautiful that everything else comes second mm -hmm. like 
if there is a priority for me so why would i sit in like and if i can lose my body mm. and that's it and then i love to sit yeah but it's so slow to move our bodies and then let's sit i do it for my meditation also i do it in my classes also i love the silence which falls into my mm. heart mm-hmm. i don't have to struggle mm-hmm. it's not a, it just becomes lighter mm. mm-hmm. things become Life. lighter and like yeah, comes lively. lively when you dance yes la- yes yes when we move our bodies together in rhythm with gratitude with innocence yes it does help in like you know does help in self awareness and self development because you do something then you get inspired and then you fight back your struggle mm-hmm. with your own blockages with your own uh, what do you want you are fighting your life with dance we all have something or the other to fight back totally 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 amazing zumisha thank you so much for being with us today thank you so much for sharing your knowledge your magic your experience it was wonderful to connect with you today it was wonderful wonderful to have this delicious conversation with you and um i hope to see you again soon in any of our luan shows it could be the podcast or luan live sessions or any new things that we're cooking So thank you so much for your for showing up and for um letting us see a bit of your truest essence. Well, thank you so much for uh you know inviting me and also the fact that somebody else is caring about beauty and art and love and you know you're really articulating it so beautifully that i have like you know we can talk about it like further you know mm-hmm. from here i don't have to make you understand so it's so beautiful and this is actually important this voice is very important i look forward for for creating something more beautiful i really like the energy i really like the vibe thank you so much for inviting me mm. on your podcast and yeah this is just the beginning of getting introduced to beauty and art exactly and by the way art art wisdom of india is conscious for women so mm. that is why i do what i do mm. it's amazing it has so many shades and so much of it's such sensual energy there that I can't tell and it's so well defined how they precise scientifically precise not medically precise like that is why you know I in the very beginning when I told you it's a synthesis of masculine and feminine with flow mm-hmm. we also need to have a certain kind of discipline to get freedom mm-hmm. otherwise just if you see just flow without any barricades or mm-hmm. without any streamlining guidance our life becomes chaos so mm-hmm. i think this is the best thing which i learned from indian wisdom mm-hmm. like That's flowing is discipline is highly disciplined mm-hmm. and then you get the freedom out of it of course like i so- remember this book from tyla tharp which is an american dancer and choreographer and her book is called the creative habit and she writes about how she created this discipline structure no she wakes up every day at 5 a.m. and she goes to the studio at 5:40 a.m. and she creates these habits and this discipline for there from there for her to be completely free and completely creative and completely you know outstanding with whatever she wants to create but first she came from discipline she came from habit yeah no i also learned it because uh, for everything in life you know I, and uh, i have discovered this meditation but i i do my own processes i make my own modules mm-hmm. like from my gurus what i have learned but then i ensure that they are simple enough for to be understood by any woman who has or any human who has not come from that background mm-hmm. so to be uh, to be creative is to be really disciplined in order to get tangible results So it's like uh the as Buddha says the middle path the uh, the aesthetics the the philosophy of beauty of India is also a middle path mm. and this philosophy really touches me because uh, when i used to do like this methodology i used to find it very i still find it a little dry but then when i look at from like from my beauty perspective they both are talking the same thing yes. so i'm like okay lord buddha is also talking the He is not talking. He is also talking about the Madhyam Marga, like the middle part, and to gain to to gain that relishness in our life, it is a middle part. Hmm. So a little bit of discipline, a little bit of you know flow, brings a lot of freedom there. So yes, mm-hmm. this is the area I'm exploring with my 
every work mm-hmm. and i work very in a very disciplined manner to bring that simplicity in that applicability it's not easy of it course. looks easy because i have undergone make made it like i really break it up to you know be really simplified for people to grasp it mm. because mm-hmm. we are not working with we are not always working with the artists we are also working in mental health addiction you know infertility mm-hmm. you know lifestyle problems yes. so yeah it is a, but then we really need beauty and art to be married with yoga the philosophy of yoga the philosophy of mental health it really it really helps yes it really helps. so no, I mean, all the best to all of us Yes, all the best to all of us. And it would be amazing to dig on deeper on these topics of aesthetics, you know, the well, aesthetic philosophy and beauty. Maybe we can do another episode soon. Ben? Yes. Thank you so and much, Misha. Thank you so much for being so enlightened and so aware. And thank you for, you know, inviting me over. Thank you. It's a yes. pleasure to have you here in Luan Emotional Podcast. Thank you so much. Same here. Thank you. Want to keep the conversation going? Luan, the world's first emotional museum, designed a global online experience to inspire and explore. Follow us on Instagram, YouTube, Telegram, and visit our site at luanmuseum.com to engage creatively.